What is going on, everybody? Happy Monday to you. Welcome back to the Die Hard MMA Podcast. I'm your host, as always, your boy, Clint, coming to you every single Monday, rain or shine, win or lose, and uh, unfortunately, we lost this week. As you can see, no blue shirt, no Die Hard stimulus this week. It was a bit of a tough one. I'm not going to lie. We have been running hot lately and i was so stoked to sit here on this show and gloat about how amazing we've done and let you know we're back over the 30 unit mark for the year and ah took it right in the pants on saturday just not a good one how is everybody doing this evening we're gonna dust that off we're gonna get right back to it and try and make some cash this saturday ufc vegas 39 we've got aiden ruse in the chat we have got Chase Warwick, Jacksonville Zo, my buddy. What's going on, my friend? Uh, Sever333, I appreciate you, my friend. Doesn't matter win or lose. Just enjoy the content and talking fights, and that's what it's all about, my friend. We have got Todd G. Bay coming in. The GOAT already kicking us off with a, a dono there. Thank you for the donation, Tajik, my friend. Everybody always supporting Pub Sports Radio. We appreciate it. Just Drew in the house. What's up, buddy? All right, everybody. I see you rolling in here. Shane with the Vikings logo, the machine, FTO combat. Let's go. All right, we got 41 live viewers in the chat tonight, and we've got a lot of fights to talk about. On top of that, we got Monday Night Football. Degenerate action on the Raiders, and I'm sweating out a uh, – one and two season in my big fat dynasty league, so I'm gonna have to keep an eye on the fantasy scores for the, for the football game tonight. I want to make sure we get the ball rolling without wasting any more time. I am excited to announce that I have an awesome guest, a guy I've been working with and talking with a lot on Twitter for a long ass time, finally making his debut here on the show. Real Mike, you may know him as Copes Corner at Copes Corner on Twitter. Mike, what you what's uh, going on tonight? How you doing, man? Uh, I'm stoked to be here with you, man, to talk about some MMA. Like you said, it's been a long time. I've had you in my ears so many times or in front of me and on camera. So stoked to be with your fans and talk about some MMA. Hell yeah, man. Let's do it. It's a good time. we got a good community. We've got good people hanging out. And uh, we're going to do our very best to put some money in their pockets, talking about every single fight, UFC Vegas 39, right here on Pub Sports Radio. Make sure you smash that like button here for us. Let the algorithm know that you enjoy the content here. Follow my man at Cope's Corner on Twitter. And uh, hey, how'd you do last week, man? Um, last week I did uh, plus 1.5 units. I did a max bet on Nico Price at a negative 175, but then my uh, 1.25 units on Joe Selecki uh, didn't come through. But mm. that's kind of my my plan with uh, Nico Price was I was so I. I was so confident in him that the max bet would clear me of the 1.25 unit loss if Joe Selecki uh, didn't come through because I knew it was going to be more of a toss up on that one. But I really liked the kid and his ground game and all around game. But uh, Gordon showed up, so hats off to him. But always stoked to cash uh, bets and still end up 1.5 units ahead. Yeah, man, good uh, good result for you. Definitely happy to hear that. Uh, Nico Price made us all sweat a little bit, but uh, mm. oh, dude. he ended up he got uh, there. <laughs> I was sweating the whole damn time. I, I originally on my my actual live stream every Wednesday night, six p.m. Pacific time on Haps TV, um, and it goes across other platforms as well. I uh, I had only Nico Price at a negative 175, 1.75, 1.75 one seventy five one point seven five one point seven five units uh, bet. And then I just like during the week, I was like tweeting on Twitter and just talked to myself I was like, you know, stop being a sissy. Max bet it, dude. And I, I max bet it and I max shit it almost. I was so cl I was like, oh, my God, Alex Oliveira is looking way too good. I thought Nico Price's ground game would look far superior than it did. Um, it looked good, but not not enough to to make that max bet uh, feel easy. I feel you, man. I feel you. That made everybody sweat. Um, I, I had a rough night. I already talked about it. Uh, minus 7.3 units over here for me, unfortunately. But, wow. man, two of those were splits. Two yeah. of those were split decision losses for two-unit bets. And it's funny. I, I've caught a lot of heat online from the haters and shit like that. You know, we're always going to get that oh, shit. Yeah. But what people fail to realize is, like, man, I lost two split decisions. Those are both <laughs> 
four plus unit swings that I, if I just get one of those bounces to go my way, it's not even that bad of a night. So a little bit rough on me, unfortunately, but MMA betting, it's all about catching bounces, man. Like sometimes you get a good split decision. Sometimes you get a bad one. Sometimes your fighter slips on a banana feeling it's mm-hmm. knocked the fuck out. He'd win that time. Not, you know, that fight night out of 10 times, but he loses the night you bet on him. That's why we love betting this stuff. And that's why we love this sport. Definitely. It gets the adrenaline going, but the judges, you know, sometimes are so, so iffy and sketchy, man. It's, uh, I, I, once I, once my fight goes to a decision and I know it's close, I'm like, this is a scratch. I don't even, I'm not even counting it right now. Cause it's an Adelie bird over there picking her nose. <laughs> That's right, man. You can never, never feel safe. If it goes to the judges scorecards, they always have a, they got a habit. They got a habit of hurting mm-hmm. us sports betters. <laughs> All right, man. Let's uh, let's go ahead and kick this bad boy off. We got a lot to talk about. Our very first fight of the evening is a banger, but I can't say it's high level, man. <laughs> Charlie <laughs> Ontiveros taking on Steve Garcia. For those of you who may not recall, Charlie Ontiveros got a very rude welcoming to the UFC when he was tasked with taking on Kevin Holland on short notice. And uh, to his credit, he came to fight. I mean, he got jumped in. He came in hard. He's got a sideways karate style fighting stance, very creative with his striking, spinning attacks, flying knees. He likes to slip and rip. This kid goes for the knockout. He really goes for it hard, but he relies on his head movement. He's extremely headable and he gets cracked every once in a while. He's got seven losses. Every single one of them has been by knockout. He will have a three inch reach advantage in this fight, which tends to help out, but man, gigantic red flag is he got taken down by Kevin Holland. Like (laughs) the guy that we keep talking about needing to patch that ground game up. He is the guy that out wrestled Charlie Ontivero. So big question marks there. His opponent, Steve Garcia, he made his UFC debut similarly against a a prospect, Luis Luis Pena, and basically got backpacked the entire entire fight. Uh, Good aggressive forward pressure. This guy likes to swing heavy bombs, Physically strong, especially in grappling situations, but he's raw, he's sloppy. He basically likes to overwhelm people and then just bomb on them. So this is a very, very sketchy fight, no matter which side you decide to back here. You've got Charlie Ontiveros plus 240 and minus 300 on Steve Garcia. Mike, uh, talk to me about this fight, man. How do you see this one playing out? Yeah, like you said, super sketchy. Um, the one thing that is uh, good to, to point out is uh, in this fight is Charlie Alta- Ontiveros fought you know Kevin Holland at 185 pounds. They uh, he th- he thought his real weight class would be down at 170 pounds at uh, Walter weight, and so now he's dropping he's dropped down not one weight class but two since he got cho- or was punked by uh, Kevin Holland. So this at 155 pounds versus Steve Garcia, who's also at one point fought at 135 pounds, I believe it was. So uh, for Steve Garcia to be a, a negative 310 is like, holy shit, dude. You, you, I don't know what you're seeing in him uh, to warrant that type of number because, um, like you said, Charlie Ontiveros, he, he does have some really explosive striking, uh, like I said, a, a real wide stance. He can, he can definitely clip you, especially if he outsizes you, and he probably hasn't outsized someone in a long time. So um, this one is, I would never in my life be putting this in a parlay or I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't bet the money line on Steve Garcia. He's definitely going to come forward and throw bombs and stuff, but, uh, he could also catch a kick coming to his face as well. Um, and end up losing you 3.1 units and kill your whole night. So, um, this is a dog or pass for me, especially because the double weight drop, um, of Charlie Ontiveros that, that I'm super curious to see how the weight cut does. And I also want to see like how that, how that power feels to Steve Garcia, who's also yeah. fought at a lower weight class. Yeah, man, it's super interesting. Lots of big questions. I don't hate the uh, the dogger pass call on that. I think that Charlie Ontiveros absolutely, his path is going to be knockout, right? Like that's what the guy does. So yep. I wouldn't hate a shot on the underdog or taking him by KO, but I think the best way that you can play this fight is violence, man. Uh, they got fight doesn't go the decision at minus 230. And while that's kind of steep that's a big price tag i feel like that would be a damn near parlay piece like either either steve garcia bombs on this guy mm-hmm. knocks him out cold because we've seen it happen before or charlie ontiveros clips him or we've got steve garcia taking this guy down and we know what happens when charlie ontiveros ends up on his back i can see so many paths to this first fight ending inside the distance i think that'd be the way i'd be looking if i was going to bet anything on it 
Yeah, that possibly be a great way, of, especially if you like uh, Garcia. If you do like Garcia and you want to get a better number, it's a slightly better number than his negative three ten. But I, I just I can't warn a bet on that. I'm not not the way that I, I teach betting. So there's it just seems like I'm Lee. I would not. I'm not touching it myself. That's I watch. feel you, man. I hear you. So just for anybody that you know doesn't know or isn't familiar with my guy Mike, he is the exact opposite of me i'm a complete degenerate i rapid fire machine gun style i take all the value i can get my hands on he on the other hand is a sniper he comes in here and he looks for very very specific spots so while he's going to talk through these fights with us give you his opinion don't be surprised if he doesn't have a whole lot of bets because he really is only looking to lock up those kill shots yeah, definitely. I max out most, maybe three bets at most if I'm feeling froggy, but like two two bets is my favorite number. And this week, uh, after coming off the max bet last week, and it was a little sketchier than I wanted, I was, I'm literally eyeing one fight, and I will get into it a little bit later that I, I just love the guy as much as Nico last week, if not more. Okay, I can't wait to hear about that one. Shout out to the chat here. We got 92 live viewers jumping in here with us. Thank you for joining your Monday evening with me. And Noli knows in the house. What's up, buddy? The king of unders himself giving out juicy cashers on with Jimmy the Bag and the other uh, Pub Sports Radio personalities here on some of those shows. Uh, Capper Comparison here in the house. John, I see you there, buddy. Andy Becerra, what's up, everybody? How we doing? All right. So let's move the show right along. Second fight of the night is one I'm already pissing people off with. <laughs> Lupita Godina is taking on Sam Hughes. And this is not just a rematch. This is a uh, a two-time rematch. This is Tril the, the tricycle. This is the trilogy. <laughs> Man, these women have fought twice already before. And the biggest problem is that none of us can find the tape. We have all been out there searching, and the organization that they fought for has gone under. Myself, my guy, uh, Manpreet, MMA Lock of the Night, we've reached out to the promoter to see if we can scrap up this tape and watch these two duke it out. No luck so far. So nobody has any idea what those first couple of fights looked like. But both... Uh, relatively decent prospects here i'd say the market has probably cooled off a little bit on sam hughes because she's coming off of back-to-back -back losses but lupita gudinez is someone that everybody still seems very high on and hey they were high on hughes before she got to the ufc so very interesting to see how this fight is gonna go gudinez uh you know what i still have a hard time understanding how she lost to jessica Penet. that was yeah, her last I fight she got weaseled out of a split decision and we talk about, you know, violence in MMA, aggression in MMA, the optics. And she was literally chucking Sarah Panay across the cage. Like, I don't, I don't know how the judges could think that one or two pitter-patter leg kicks or a jab was worth more than bodily throwing somebody. <laughs> I 100% <laughs> but... agree. <laughs> Now, I know some people that took the shot on Penne, man. And, I mean, congrats for cashing a ticket. But that spoiled some parlays that night. Oh, it did. I I, I, uh, I think I might even bet uh, her for dis on a decision, and she had uh, lost. So I, I – because the only way to get value on her was that night. But all I know is I was not on Penne. I never have been, and I cannot – But I, when she wins, it just irks my soul. I mean, it's, there's a couple – only a couple fighters that it happens to, and lucky Lauren Murphy was one of those. Yep. Yep, man. We hey, we talked about judges, right? Yeah. <laughs> judges in MMA. So Gudina is she's a little tank, man. Uh, nice lead hook. She's got a pop on her right hand. Very physically strong. She likes to use trips to get the fights to the to the ground where she wants it to be. And when I talk about how physically strong she is, I mean there were spots in that fight where Panay got full backpack on her, and she just stood up. It was like, no problem. You got another full human being on her back. And she's like, all right, I'm just going to get back up now. She's got solid submission defense. She's aggressive. Uh, I think we can see a lot from Lupita Gudinez going forward. And word on the street, shout out to my guy, James Lynch. She's been training with uh, Sarah Kaufman for this camp going into it. And uh, it makes me a little bit scared because she's training with some very, very good fighters here, and I made a stance on this bet. Sam Hughes on the flip side of this thing. Uh, really rough start. Really rough start. She was thrown to the Wolves against Tisha Torres. Obviously, that didn't end well for her. And then she got Loma Lukbunmi, which we all know how slick of a striker Loma is, and if you can't take her down, you're just going to get chopped up all night. So she had a rough run for her first two fights in the UFC. 
She likes to uh, carry her hands low a little bit, swings away when she gets into close range, but she's got a really strong body lock, man. And she is more than capable of bullying her opponents up against the cage. She also has a very stiff right hand and a very snappy jab. She's got good slips. She's got good head movement. And she likes to duck under her opponent's offense to get to the clinch position. She's going to have a three-inch reach in this matchup, uh, three inch reach advantage, that is. And honestly, man, I, I already took the shot on uh, Sam Page, which, by the way, uh, all time great MMA fight name there. Uh, I got Sam Hughes. I did maybe get a little antsy in my pantsy again with my first oh, no. bet of the night. I put two units on Sam Hughes at plus 160 because the fact of the matter is, man, I think this is a huge recency bias spot for a lot of people. And I think this fight should be a pick em. I know everyone's going to look at the record and say, look, Lupita already won a fight against Sam Hughes, but the five-round fight that they had went to a draw. So they have fought very closely and competitively. Even though we haven't seen the footage, we know that those fights were at least competitive. And I think that Sam Hughes has impressed in her losses, or at least in her loss, <laughs> to Loma Luke Boonmi, where she was coming on hard in that third round, kind of getting back into the fight after giving away the early rounds to a very, very strong caliber fighter. Whereas Lupita Gudinez struggled, and while she should have beat Jessica Panay, it was still a close fight, much closer than maybe it should have been. So I think it's that recency bias of everybody saying, Lupi should have won versus... 0 oh, and 2 Sam Hughes giving us this line. I may lose this bet, man, but I feel like it's going to play out closely, and I think we're headed for a split decision. Oh, man. I I, I really hope that you hit this one, man. But I, with I, Lupita versus Sam, Sam Hughes, the biggest problem with me to jump on board with her is that she's not a great striker and she's not a great wrestler. And so you, I need you to be one of them if I'm going to back you. And the way she <laughs> in, the way she enters in for single leg or double legs is just so sloppy and amateur. She has her back all hunchback like the Notre Dame, the 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 <laughs> I mean, can't even say it. The, I, the either way, hunchback, she has her, hunchback in Notre Dame <laughs> has her back all hunched in when she goes in for the single or double leg. Um, and so that that worries me because I can't even confidently say that she's going to get her down on the ground. You're right though. Sam Hughes does like to have her up against uh, the her in. The way she likes to fight is up against the cage, dirty, mm -hmm. and just throw, and throwing punches. But Lupita Godinez is she's probably as strong, if not stronger, than Sam, and kind of likes to do the same thing, and that's bully bully uh, girls around. Like you said, she's training with Sarah Kaufman now, and I also I heard uh, Alexa Grasso for her hands. That's and, the one that worries me. Yeah, and <laughs> and you know uh, with that Mexican cardio, um, I dude, I I'm. I, I like Lupita in this one, man. So I, I'm with James Lynch on you. So I'm sorry, my dude. No, I, I feel you, man. And honestly, the one, I w if you didn't touch on it, I was going to get there afterward. A, a training with Alexa Grasso is the one that made me go white. I was like, oh, oh. shit. Like, Grasso, Grasso is one of my, like, sleeper picks, man. I saw her coming a mile away and was like, I love so this I. girl. Yeah. And when she started putting it all together, it was just like, you know, the, the clouds parting and the light hit me like, oh, it was, I knew it was coming and it finally started to happen. I, I think she's going to be a problem. And if she has taken someone like Lupita Godinez under her wing, that's terrifying. And uh, full, full uh, honesty with the chat and with everyone tuning in for this live stream and everybody already attacking me in the YouTube comments <laughs> who are watching this on Wednesday, Thursday, uh, I may actually hedge off or cash out of this bet this time. I made a bad bet last week and I decided to go down with the ship <laughs> because I felt like I owed it to the people who I told I was betting it on the Monday show. And, uh, I'm not doing that again, man. <laughs> when I make a bad bet, if I've got that cash out option available to me, if I know I've made a bad bet, I'm going to use it to save myself some money. So make sure you follow me on Twitter at DieHardMMAPod. You get my actual bets when I lock them in. And if I ever have to like hedge off of something, that's where you'll find out about it. And this one, I'm terrified. Uh, <laughs> I think I should have made it a one unit play rather than a two unit play. And that's where now I'm just kind of deciding how I want to handle that moving forward because I, I do think it should be a 50-50. I do think that Hughes can probably slow this pace down, get into the grinding, be the more physical fighter of the two. But with the hands of Lupita Gudinez probably being you know the better striker of the two, I could see this split decision going the wrong way because she's the one who's being a little flashier in front of the judges.
Yeah, that that's where I just with Hughes, like I said, I know Lupita got better hands in her for sure. I could already say that. And I and now I can't say Hughes is gonna get her down on the ground because like I said, if you watch her tape, she does not shoot in good for single leg or double legs at all, and her back is hunched. It's the trips. Yeah, she gets yeah. in on the body lock and she tries to, you know, kick their feet out and stuff like that to drag them to the floor. Um, in the chat here, <laughs> Peter, no, you're just in time for the simp pick, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, somebody, I, I lost it. Dang it, the chat went flying by. John, there you go, buddy. Asking what the bad bet was last week. It was Shanna Young. It was Shanna oh. Young. I did the tape study on that one, man. And Mike, I still, I will still sit here and defend my position on Shanna Young from a skill set perspective, but when they faced off, when I saw the size difference between Shannon Young and Edgar, I went, oh shit, this was a mistake. Because when you take two people that are roughly equally skilled and one of them is bigger and stronger, that's the difference maker. That's oh, it at the end sure. of the day. That I was just like, oh, this was a, if they weighed the exact same, if they were eye to eye, if their bodies frames were the same, I would ride that bet all day. I think uh, Young is better than she's shown us so far in the UFC, but Egger was massive, and I really <laughs> wish I had hedged off or cashed out of that bet because it cost me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think you you swayed me even a little bit towards more uh, Shanna Young. You know, we're one of the uh, first shows to go out. You know, you, it's James Lynch, then you, and then pretty much me on Wednesday. Uh, I used to do Tuesday night, but uh, the Contender Series or in the Ultimate Fighter is really what I switched for because I was competing on that Tuesday night it was killing me. So switched over to Wednesday. So it's you know it takes balls to do what you do, and that's put out bets before anyone. And with no, there's no one else for you to be like, oh, you you copied that guy, dude. You copied that. Bet. <laughs> I, people because that's man. gonna happen anyways they're never happy bro you could hit a plus 130 underdog and kill it and then you hit you hit a, a negative 180 and they're like oh that was an easy pick that was that was they were gonna win i was like oh, they were they were i was like that's not easy i'll bet on all the one eight negative 180s and then i'll just win all the time right people people getting pissy about laying chalk because it's an easy play like i'm sorry i i can't help but laugh when when yeah. people get like that you're yeah that's right you're never gonna please anybody and uh again for anybody who's relatively new uh, to the show. I I am one of the first people to market doing the show on Monday and a lot changes throughout the week. Like we get new information. We get to see them on the scales. We get the mm -hmm. fighter interviews that come out, like all kinds of stuff changes. So unless I make it an official bet on my Twitter, like you got to take everything we say with just a little bit of a grain of salt. Cause a lot of people boot this show up on Thursday or Friday before the fights <laughs> and they're missing out on the rest of the week's reads. So again, make sure you tune into my Friday show because that's where I kind of go back over everything and re-clarify what we've learned over the course of the week. Yeah, because I could uh, say because we could say something Monday or Wednesday, but on Friday the scales tell me what the real truth is. Exactly, they tell you what you really need to know. All right, all right. So I do have a position here. I did bet Sam Hughes, and everybody in the world hates it, and the market <laughs> is moving the other way. So that's where we're at, man. <laughs> Next fight up. Charles Rosa returns to the UFC, taking on Jamin Jackson. Damon Jackson. And this is a grappler's delight. We're going to have another fun, scrambly, wrestling-heavy fight here on this one, man. Uh, what we've got is Charles Rosa moving to Sanford MMA, which everybody and their mom who is struggling in their UFC career right now seems to be doing, and I can't say I blame them. Sanford MMA is hot at the moment. Their coaches are doing good things. They've got a good stable of fighters, so seems to be working for people. Um, he struggles, though. He struggles. I mean, he just came off a split decision over Justin Janes, and then from what I'm hearing in his interviews and stuff, he's talking about his injuries, and we know he has, like, been plagued with injuries basically his entire career, but you kind of hate to see a fighter blaming their losses on injuries constantly. It kind of becomes a... It becomes a storyline that's hard to swallow after a while. Regardless, Charles Rosa has high-level Brazilian jiu-jitsu. We know he's good on the ground. He's got decent boxing on the feet. He is talented, but he struggles with wrestlers. Anybody who is physically stronger than him or just has better wrestling seems to be able to get on top of him and dominate him and stay safe from those submission attacks. Damon Jackson training out of Fortis MMA, so a clash of hot gyms at the moment. This guy is tall and long. He likes to attack the body with those big, long knees. He's a crazy good scrambler on the mat, and he likes to uh, use those long arms of his, man. He, he hits chokes from crazy angles that people just do not see coming because he's got those lanky, long limbs. He knows how to sweep from bottom. He made Mursad Bektik quit 
in his uh, fight where he got back to the UFC, which was cool to see. But now he's coming off a loss. He got his ass beat by Ilya Taporia, which <laughs> at this point, who isn't getting their ass beat by Ilya Taporia? Damon Jackson going to have a two-inch reach advantage here. And if I may... Charles Rosa has alternated wins and losses since 2014, man, and he is coming <laughs> off a win. So, so you know what are you doing, means. Mike? What are you doing with this one? <laughs> um, this this is a tough fight for me to pick, uh, just to gauge you to bet on. Uh, with Charles Rosa being a BJJ black belt under uh, the infamous Ricardo Laborio, who's a Carl's, Carl's, Carlson Gracie uh, six degree black belt. Um, he's also one of the original owners of AT, co founders of ATT. So I, I really like his uh, jiu jitsu coach. I like his jiu jitsu game, and he's going against the purple belt. And um, um, what's it called? Sorry, one second. Uh, Damon Jackson. And so with Charles Rosa, like you said in the interviews, he was, you know, talking about he's making a lot of excuses, like you said. And like, I don't really like the tone that he and the, and what he, the way he was talking and his confidence. Um, he's like, said, he's talking about injuries and he's like, he's not even talking about like, I've been training hard. I've been here. I've been, I've been pushing harder. My cardio is better than ever. My jujitsu sick. Like I just told you his coach is badass. So you could even gloat about that. He's not even talking about that stuff. And uh, normally like, when it just comes to BJJ versus each other, like I have Charles Rosa here as the slicker submission artist, but if he wanted to be there, I'm not sure if he want. I'm not even sure if he does want to be there uh, anymore. And so this is going to be a great fight to watch for, like I said, uh, wrestlers, grapplers, delight. Um, and on paper, the BJJ of Charles Rosa should be superior than Damon Jackson, but he could get hit in the face by Damon Jackson and, and a change. But Damon Jackson has been finished so many times, but he's been uh, not only knocked out by punches and knees and choked out. I, I can never, I have a rule. If you've napped or tapped, I'm not backing you, especially in this upper uh, echelon. So uh, I can't do it. So I, I have to go with the BJJ black belt of Charles Rosa and, and pray that that gets me by. But I, like I said, this is, just, I'm just, I'm siding with him for experience and because of that BJJ black belt versus the purple belt. Okay. Okay. Uh, so I, I'm going to lean the other way. This is one that I have zero interest in betting whatsoever. Yep. Do not. I'm going to I'm gonna side with the favorite, man. I'm going to say Damon Jackson has enough in the tank to get it done here. I just think Charles Rosa is on a steep decline. And like you talked about, I think that the comments that he's making and the interviews and stuff, I got to wonder where his head is at. I just don't think there's much left for Rosa these days. I, I feel like the game has passed him by. I don't think he's evolving and because of that, the fighters that are kind of keeping up are going to be the ones that take advantage of him. And I do think Damon Jackson is that kind of a guy. So I'm going to say Damon Jackson, but no way can I bet a guy that's been finished, like you said, as many times as he has at minus 180 in this spot. Yeah, so let me refer. Pretty much it's dog or pass on that, especially with the experience of Charles Rosa and the BJJ Black Belt. It's like I, I if, if it was like underdog money on the other guy, I, then I would do it, but it's not. It's oh, like, yeah. I can't. Yep, and I think uh, I think the bookies know that. <laughs> if, you know, if this uh, yeah. this line opened up, pick them almost, man. It looks like Damon Jackson was a minus one twenty five favorite, and he's been smoked all the way down to one eighty. I would be on board at minus one twenty five if I had caught the opener. Mm -hmm. I absolutely would have bet Damon Jackson. Yeah, I like that number. I like that number a lot for Damon Jackson and, and being more youthful and uh, having a higher ceiling now. But be coming off of knockout losses and stuff, that I just it's gross. I have to just stop. I just want. I just have to watch this. Like, I, there's nothing that gives me like a ton of confidence for to bet this. Like you said, absolutely. All right, man. Let's not waste too much time on it then, since it's one of those ones where we can just uh, grab a snack, fireball, mm -hmm. and popcorn, if you will, man. We'll take a break, get a snack, get a munchie, and by the way, head to the shop at Pub Sports Radio if you want to snag one of these shirts because we've got all the different uh, merch options over there for y'all. Next up, we've got Alexander. Romanov, the man they call King Kong, coming back to the UFC, taking on Jared Vandera. And this is a fight that I am extremely interested in, man. First thing, though, got to set the stage. Kong is coming off a win that he in no way deserves. He beat Juan Espino in his I, last fight. <laughs> I shit, I shit my pants in that win that we bet on my show, and I will. I wish I could have taken it back the second the fight happened. Dude, I so I was bullish. I mean, over the top, confident, and talking shit mm -hmm. about Juan Espino, um, yeah. and I was robbed that night. <laughs> like Juan Espino, first off, he made a bad choice. He did jump guillotine and ended up on bottom, which you can never do 
<laughs> against a guy like Romanov. But even so, he still fought his way back into that fight. And he was coming on so strong in that third round that Kong took the illegal blow and went, I'm about to get my ass kicked. So he, exactly. took, he took his option and got out of there with a greasy decision win because the third round didn't finish. Juan Espino was about to pound that man's face in because he had nothing mm -hmm. left in the tank. That said, I think he's going to destroy Jared Vandera on Saturday, man. Alexander Romanov, they call him Kong for a reason. This man is a big, big heavyweight. He likes to take people down. He likes to sit on their chest and pound them into oblivion. He's got nasty chokes from all over the place. He's got that forearm choke that he can just kind of lean into you on and completely cut off everything in your neck, yeah. not just the air, like all the blood. He's huge. And what we have seen from Jared Vandera is he's a volume striker type of guy. He's aggressive. He has to get in your face. He has to stay in front of you. And he doesn't have a ton of power, so he peppers you with shots. And I know a lot of people are going to say that Alexander Romanov's gas tank is questionable. But it's really not when he controls the fight. Because if he can take you down and put you on your back and just kind of lay on top of you, he can do that for 25 minutes. It's not a problem. Now, a guy like Juan Espino, a world champion wrestler, absolutely gave him problems and gassed him out in the grappling. We saw Jared Vandera get taken down without any type of an issue against Sergey Spivak. And it was easy for Sergey Spivak to get this man to the ground. And then he got finished in the second round. One of the biggest things I noticed, man, was that when... Uh, you get Jared Vandera off balance, the foot sweeps are the biggest problem for him. And that's one of the things that Alexander Romanov does best is he will tilt you just slightly off balance, kick your foot out, and that's it. You're on the mat. And then you've got a 200 and let's be real by fight night, 280 pound man laying on top mm -hmm. of you and you're not getting back up. So even though Vandera has a five inch reach advantage, even though some people are going to be a little scared of Romanov's gas tank. I think this is Kong by murder. And I wouldn't be surprised if he goes back to finishing in the first round here. I've got Kong in a parlay. Yeah, I absolutely agree, dude. Alexander King Kong Romanov, dude, this guy is absolutely a lot of fun to watch besides the last fight with versus Spino. He was fun for about one round and then he scared <laughs> the shit out of me. But when it comes to this fight with versus Jared Vandera, um, this his ground game to me and ground and pound is just light years ahead of Jared Vandera. Um, if you go and look at his interview with uh, James Lynch that Jared did, he, he just sounds like I, I hate to say just such a meathead, man. Like his answers are so like he's like, what's your what's your favorite thing to eat food? I mean, like it, it's so bland. There's nothing like professional about him. And he like uh, he's not organized in any way. And, and you can tell why just like, just in everything that you do in life kind of just trickles downhill. And at, this is just a showcase spot for, I think, believe Alexander Romanov to absolutely smash him and then maybe match us up like a Tom Aspinall versus him. And then I love Tom Aspinall, so maybe I could get a better line there. But I really like I like Alexander Romanov here by devastation round one. And I just like you said, I, I love that bet, dude. Dude, I'm glad to hear you're with me on that because yeah. I'll be honest, after I tweeted out the play, I had a couple people poking holes in it that I was like, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> hey, am always, I not seeing something? <laughs> you're always gonna have people poking holes, but dude, the the ground. I mean, Jared on his back, dude. I mean, it's not like he has a good get up game. It's not. No. This is a heavyweight stuff. Um, you know, once he's on his back, it, it should be a wrap. He he fought Sergey Spivak's first takedown and didn't even get all the way back to his feet before he was on the ground again. And then he never got up. He spent it, the entire first round on his back, and then in round two, like I said. Very first thing that happened is they clinched up trip takedown, and that was it. He was tapping in a couple of minutes. And Sergey is, is maxed out at 238 pounds with no weight cut. He was trying to make it be 265. So we're talking about a small guy got you down. You better pray to God that he's not get you down that first round. But uh, it, Jared's interview said said he's kind of he's going to run away the first round. Uh, I kind of tend to believe he's going to. I mean, we're the problem is we're in the small cage. I, 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 I don't would be fearful <laughs> if this yeah. was a pay per view card. And he had the big cage to use that footwork and use that speed and run around. I would absolutely think that Jared Vandera was live in this spot. But being in the small cage in the apex, you got nowhere to run. Like Kong can just do one sprint across the cage and you're done. <laughs> yeah, good, good, good point there, dude. I totally forgot it was a smaller octagon this weekend.
Yeah, I think that makes a huge difference in this fight. Uncle Wheezy checking in from vacation. What's up, buddy? Let's cash some tickets. And uh, Reggae Panda in the chat saying, Kong is kind of a pussy. The guy doesn't like getting touched. <laughs> and while that's true, Reggae Panda, uh, this ain't the spot, though. Jared Van Aaron doesn't hit hard. The dude's got pillow fists. Like, he he will beat on somebody for 15 minutes on his way to a decision, but he's not knocking anybody out. He's not putting anybody down. Even, even with, you know, if he sat on his biggest punch, Kong would walk through it and clinch him. And that's why I, I just think Kong is – I don't use the L word on this show. There is no such thing as a lock in MMA, but I'm extremely confident uh, in Kong this week. We fade we fade Romanov when he fights a real heavyweight prospect. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, I'm glad we agree on that one, man. I feel like that one's pretty easy to break down. Hopefully no surprises this week on that particular fight because uh, – yeah, I put a fat bet on that parlay. <laughs> ah, I'm nervous already. Next uh, fight up, Leonardo Staropoli taking on Jeremy Pickett. And another really weird spot, man. This entire card, this week and next week, everyone just prepare yourselves. It's going to be weird spots for the next several weeks in a row. Leonardo Staropoli is staying at 185 for some reason. I mean, uh, he's a big guy for 170. I get that. And he's young, so maybe he's just kind of filling his frame out. But we saw what happened against a real 185 or the last time he went out there and he got bodied by Delizze, just simply mm-hmm. out-muscled by the bigger, stronger dude. He's a solid striker, man, but he goes one for one. He averages 3.64 significant strikes a minute, absorbing 3.85. So he kind of relies on hitting his opponents harder than they hit him. It just hasn't really worked out so far in the UFC. He has short blitz attacks. He's always fighting in combinations, which I do like that. He attacks the body. This is a perfect case of a young fighter who I think has all the tools and just hasn't been able to quite get it done yet. So we'll see if the move to 185 ends up being a good move or a bad move for him in the long run. But he really relies on his durability and his gas tank, which can be a problem. Jamie Pickett on the flip side of this thing. He's 1-4 and four in the UFC if you count his Contender Series appearances. He went 0-2 on Contender. They brought him back for the third one. He finally pulled the trigger and got to the big show where he immediately took another L against the Beverly Hills Ninja. Mm-hmm. But he is a real 185er, man. Jeremy P- Jamie Pickett is huge. This dude is massive for the division. He is long. He's going to have a 9-inch reach advantage in this spot. He knows how to fight long and use that range. He's got a long 1-2 on him, and he's got good footwork. He likes to play on the outside. The problem with him is he struggles to pull the trigger. Jamie Pickett is a guy who has no volume on him, and when he does finally decide to explode, he's got some solid power on him. It's just few and far between when he finally does pull that trigger. He's always running away. He's always giving up ground. As far as optics goes with the judges, like he just seems like he's constantly on the defensive, even if he is doing well. The thing is, he's durable. He had that TKO stoppage from uh, right, and he actually wasn't out. It was a referee stoppage. So even though he has one KO loss on his record, he really hasn't ever been knocked out. Considering Leonardo Staropoli has struggled to get people out of the octagon, I don't think he's knocking out Jamie Pickett. So it's kind of, to me, a volume of Staropoli versus... Can Pickett just be the bigger man and bully him against the fence or bomb on him if he finally decides to let loose? Um, I, I don't understand this line, man. If, if we're being honest, I simply don't understand the line. Leonardo Storopoli is minus 200. We got plus 160 somewhere in the ballpark, plus 180 on the dog, Jamie Pickett. I would love to take the underdog here in this spot considering the reach advantage, considering all the things that he could do physically here but you just can't trust this guy to throw. So because of that, it's got to be a pass for me. How do you feel about this fight? Yeah, you couldn't. You could have said it better, man. Uh, Jamie Pickett. He, if you look at his amateur in his earlier career, this dude's a lot of fun, man. He talks shit to his opponents a lot, like the Diaz brothers does. Um, really explosive, a lot of power. But as he's gotten to the upper echelon of the sport, he just seems to lack, like you said, the volume that he needs to throw to knock a motherfucker out, you know. And so. With yeah. this spot here versus Lorano, that that reach advantage is going to be vicious, man. I like Jamie Pickett standing up uh, versus Lorano um, on with the whole fight. I, what I'm what I'm not, I'm not sure about with Jamie Pickett is I'm not sure about his wrestling game. I'm not sure about how he's going to react when he's on his back. 
So with, with that said, it's 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 hard for me to to fully back him because I love wrestling grappling. And so, but this line is, I think, off. Um, I think that Lorano may be a negative 150, something like that could be a, a better number. But I, I just, I think it's kind of crazy for uh, Lorano, who's going to be, like you said, he's, he's not a true 185 pounder. He's much like Darion Wynn, who fights later on in this card. Uh, and so I, I, this is a dog or pass spot for me. And I actually like Jamie Pickett's striking and his viciousness when he decides to throw it. If he just believes in his damn self and he just launches those hands and kicks, dude, he, he could he could do this. So um, I'm dog or pass with Jamie Pickett here. I completely agree with you, man. It's a dog or pass spot. If you you know what, if Jamie Pickett could call up Clay Guida's brother, mm -hmm. and if he could like slap the shit out of him going into the cage <laughs> on Saturday, yeah. I would bet all the units on Jamie Pickett. Like the guy is raw. He's got everything. He's got every advantage in this particular fight, but we just can't trust him to do shit with it. So mm. yeah, man, I think, uh, I think Jamie Pickett's very live. I think he's live for the knockout. We've seen him double leg people with great success. And we've also seen that you can absolutely grind out a guy like Leonardo Stropoli with the size and the strength advantage of Pickett. I believe that actually the wrestling might be a solid path to victory for him. So I'm kind of feeling Jamie Pickett by decision here just because I can't count on him to get a knockout. And like I said, Staropoli's not knocking out anybody. So I think this one's going over, and I definitely lean dog or pass. Yeah, I like it. All right, man. Glad we agree. We got a question here for you. Be in the comments. Cope, you got a YouTube page? You know, uh, I do. It's it's not it's not up like as big as everyone else's since I just rebranded, but it's it's my own personal page. I think it's M K O P E three. Um, that's my YouTube. But on if you go to Hap, Haps TV is where I push out my stuff. Facebook Copes Corner K O P E S K O R N E R and uh, Twitter. And so those are basically the where I put out my content. There you go. Make sure you follow my guy over there. Get in the know. What's up, boss? The Nick buddy in the house. How you doing tonight, man? All right, next fight. Uh, you know what? Before we go on to the next fight, I do have to shout out my other sponsors real quick. Y'all know it was coming. Goat Capital Sports, at Goat Capital underscore on Twitter. They have been with me since the beginning. I love those guys. I am trying to get better at NHL, at NFL, but let's face it, I'm middle of the road, probably still losing both of those sports. Make sure you tune into Goat Capital Sports if you're looking for picks. If you can't digest all the information that we give here on Pub Sports Radio, they have very reasonably priced packages for straight picks, and they're solid. They know what they're doing over there. Love those boys. And they also have a risk free guarantee if you lose over the course of a week with the picks that you've purchased from them, they will refund you that week's subscription. So, Hard to go wrong with that. At Goat Capital underscore, make sure you check them out. We got 164 live viewers. Thank you all so much for spending your Monday nights here with us tonight. Degenerate Action, I'm on the radios. Waller Anytime TD, thank me later. We are going here. Chris Gutierrez taking on Felipe Calares. Yes. And this is the fight that closes out my parlay. I'm just going to go ahead and spoil it right there for everybody. The seven-unit parlay, baby, seven units, to win five. I'm on the Gutierrez side here in this spot. Yeah, and people have been asking me, man, people have been asking me all week, are you fading Kalaras? Are you trusting Gutierrez? Like everybody seems to kind of question what's going on with this leg of the parlay. And let me tell you, it's both. You know, the commercial with the little taco girl where she goes, why can't we have both? Like that's what this is. I love the game of Chris Gutierrez and everybody is out there being like El Guapo, only has leg kicks. That's it. That's all the guy does. No, he's got so much more than that. He just doesn't need to show us anything more than that because he destroys everybody with those Maybe leg lost kicks. Clint for a second. The guy's got hey, – Mike, you still there, buddy? Yeah, we're here. Oh, okay. I, I thought you said we lost each other there. I think, yeah. So, but no, you clipped out for a second. Sorry. <laughs> all right, all right. We're still here. We're good. Um, man, he's got, he's got good hands. People forget about how good of hands uh, Gutierrez is. And you know what else he's got? He's got fight IQ and he's got cardio. To shout out my guy, Rockstar Z, Guapo is a good soldier. You know exactly what you're getting when this guy goes into the cage. He's got a game plan. He puts a pace on his opponents and he will attack those legs. When he attacks the legs, that opens up other opportunities for his striking and he will always play the game. There's some fighters that refuse to play the game of MMA so it looks good on the judges' scorecards. 
Chris knows exactly what he's doing, and it plays to him very, very favorably. Even if he loses the first round against a fighter that come out comes out fast and starts early, he is tough, he is durable, he grinds his way back into that fight, and he will fight for your money all the way up until the end. He's a fighter you want to put your money on. Felipe Clara is on the flip side of this thing. Extremely questionable in my opinion, whether or not he's actually UFC caliber. I mean, he probably is, but I think he's mid to low tier in the UFC, if I'm being honest. He's lanky, he's tall, but he's heavy on his feet. He's got a very classic Muay Thai style, and you know what that means? He puts his hands up like this, and he goes heavy on that front leg. That thing is going to be there to get the shit kicked out of it by my guy, Chris Gutierrez. He does have heavy hands, so Felipe Claras can always spoil the show with a big knockout. I'm not underestimating that whatsoever, but he's willing to stand and trade. He's got terrible takedown defense, but a good get-up game. He pops right back up to his feet, but if you watch the Sanders fight, cool hand Luke Sanders, his last opponent, he was sucking wind in the second round, man. If you make this guy work even just a little bit, if you don't let him fight his pace, he slows down, he gets tired, he gasses out, and that's exactly how Chris Gutierrez breaks people. Outside of some kind of a flash knockout, I think this line should be wider, man. I think this is Chris Gutierrez all day. Talk to me, Mike. How do you feel about this fight? Unless we lost you. I couldn't I couldn't agree any stronger, man. This is actually the one fight on the card that I looked at it right away, and I will bet my life on it. I bet my house. I bet both my balls. I bet my firstborn son. Uh, you know, Chris Gutierrez <laughs> is an absolute monster. He's also a purple belt in BJJ. Um, this guy, the way that he kicks and the volume that he throws with them too, in the way that he can with the power, um, is going to be devastating for Kolaris because Kolaris is very, very hittable. And like you said, he stands on that lead leg and Chris Gutierrez it throws legs like nobody else. He's got that Mexican uh, uh, gas tank on him for the cardio. Um, and I just feel like he's going to be just smashing Felipe Carras's leg in his face. I feel like he could also do a very similar combination to Valentina did on Lord Murphy as uh, Felipe's backing up against the cage and just throwing combos, combos, to do a kick to his face. Um, I, ju I just think Chris Gutierrez is just a lock here. I rarely say it, but this is one of the times that I fire, and I, I'm 100% confident that Chris Gutierrez is going to smoke Felipe Calares under the ground. But sick, dude. So he does have the ability to take the back and possibly screw us, but I just don't see it, dude. I feel like he's going to be smashed into the ground, and Chris Gutierrez's night is going to be made. I love hearing that, man, especially the style of betting that you have, the way that you're very conservative and the way that you wait to fire unless you really love a spot. The fact that we are syncing up on that, and it's a big part of my parlay. Yeah. Love like hearing that you're so yeah. confident on it. Yeah, I'll bet more now. <laughs> That's fantastic, man. All right, so for those of you who don't know, the legendary seven-unit bet is back in action here, and I've only made one seven-unit bet ever, ever. In the history of my betting, in the history of the podcast, only one has ever taken mm -hmm. place. And so I have a 1-0 and o record when firing off nice. on seven units. And we're going back to it. This is the spot. Is this parlay here for me? King Kong, Romanov, and, and Gutierrez, El Guapo. I got minus 140. So seven units to win five is the big boy bet here in this spot. Let's go, dude. I'm stoked, man. I can't wait. I'm, like I said, I'm already nervous. Like, even, <laughs> after, even after how confident I am in the bet, I'm extremely nervous. It wouldn't, about, be, ner uh, it wouldn't be betting without being nervous. Oh, yeah. Because, well, I mean, like we said, it's MMA. Anything could happen. Like if one of these guys slips on a banana peel, it's going to be a large L for me, and I really don't want to take that. But I'm, I'm confident in both these guys getting it done. Agree. All right, man. Next fight up. We got Phil Hawes taking on Duran win and what we have is a very interesting spot where one fighter i was immediately looking to fade when he made it to the ufc versus a fighter that i was looking towards backing and they have since switched roles <laughs> <laughs> phil hawes was a guy that i just didn't buy i knew that he was going to struggle with his gas tank issues he was round one or bust i mean i talked all kinds of shit mm -hmm. on phil hawes he moves out to Sanford MMA, and he has completely reinvented himself. This man is a certified monster right now. 
He's a physical specimen. He's a great wrestler. His game plan has been tweaked. His gas tank is better. He knows how to pace himself, and he still has that big power when he decides he wants to uncork it. He's going to have a huge size advantage in this fight, a 7-inch reach advantage, and taking on Duran Wynn, a guy that's mini Daniel Cormier, one of my absolute favorite fighters in the world. I loved what Duran Wynn had. Solid wrestling, fast hands, good boxing. He's durable as shit. Like I loved everything I saw from Duran Wynn. And he has just done nothing but disappoint since he got here. And he's not even making the right moves to improve and to get better and to to head the direction that he really needs to to have success in the UFC. So now we've got a spot where they're running into each other. And the guy that I would love to bet on as a massive underdog, I can only talk about fading. We got Phil Hawes sitting here as a minus 280, plus 220 of the comeback on Deron Wynn. And... Deron Wynn is going to try to volume up Phil Hawes without getting killed. <laughs> or he's going to try to impose his grappling, which I don't know how he's going to pull that off because Phil Hawes has excellent grappling and is the much bigger man here in this spot. Uh, Mike, am I crazy? Like, I know everybody thinks Phil Hawes is another lock this week, but does Deron Wynn have a path to victory here? Do you see him squeezing out a win somehow? No, I, I don't, man. I, I feel like he's great, just greatly outsized for this uh, division. I, it's one of those guys that doesn't seem to want to be disciplined enough to either diet or do whatever they need to do to drop down to a weight class that would be more suitable for him. Um, you know, uh, Phil Haas was a 197-pound junior college wrestling champion at Iowa Central. Um, he's got brown belt and BJJ, man. Um, you know, he's so big, man. I mean, what's the the reach advantage of the two? Wasn't it? Isn't it like eight, seven? It's crazy. Inches? Seven inches. Seven and a half inches. You know, and um, Darion Wynn, You know, he he relies on that wrestling. Well, when you two two wrestlers basically equal to each other, and the size of Phil's um, will actually be able to out technique. If, even if Duran has better technique. It could possibly uh, take that away from Darren Wynn because of just the size and strength of a bigger man like Phil Hawes. So when it comes to wrestling, I feel like this is a scratch. And then we're talking about striking. I believe that Phil Hawes, this is his fight to win, man. Uh, I feel like th this is his spot. That's why you see the line where it's at. It's it, To me, kind of like a lock. I feel like the, the UFC, they like um, Phil Hawes and, and the way he's going. And Darren Wynn's just kind of there, plateaued and, and just dropped. I'm not a big fan of Darion Wynn, so I don't know if it's if, if it's just me not liking his diet, just the way he diets and the way he just is just is an MMA fighter in general. But I like Phil Haas all day in this matchup. It seems like they're selling on Darion Wynn, doesn't it? Like it yeah. almost feels like the UFC is like, all right, we're done. Like here's one more fight. Good luck. <laughs> yeah, and not a, not an easy one either. Exactly, exactly. It's like they're trying to get a, a little bit more spring in the step of Phil Haas, and I mean. It's one of those moments where the UFC can't lose because if Deron Wynn comes out here and pulls off this upset, mm. all of a sudden you got all that hype back. We've seen nothing but good things from Phil Hawes in his last couple of fights. And if Deron Wynn pulls off the upset, it's a mountain of a deal. It's a big deal. So they get all that hype piled back onto him. However, if Phil Hawes steamrolls, they just keep trucking with the kid that already looks good and is extremely popular with the people at the moment. So really solid matchmaking here, in my opinion, by the UFC. One thing I do want to ask you about, though, man, is the total. Because we've got fight goes to decision at plus 105. Fight doesn't go the distance is minus 145. And I'm seeing a lot of people liking violence here in this spot. The one angle that I'd be extremely tempted in here in this spot is relying on the durability of Duran win. I took the over one and a half when he fought Antonio Ohio because I figured even if he didn't win the fight, if he could just stay in it, get the wrestling going early, that it could squeeze over that one and a half considering the fight doesn't go the distance is at minus 145 plus 105. We're probably going to get another one and a half here in this spot. Do you think it squeezes over that or do you think it's a, a round one Hawes type of situation? I think we lost Mike there for a second. Sorry, live stream life. There we go. <laughs> Sorry, my dude. No, you're good. So, do you think it squeezes over the one and a half, or uh, do you think it's going on? Oh, dude, it's cutting. It cut out again, right as you asked me. Yeah, in this fight, yeah, yeah, the over, the over one and a half. You said right. That's what you're looking at. Yeah, yeah. Seeing if it, you think it goes over or under. I think it goes over the one and a half. I think the the, the two wrestlers, the, it, it's going to be. 
it could end up being a, a slightly boring fight, but uh, you know, just looking Phil Haas looking a little better with the striking and the volume. So I, I just I think the over one and a half. Woo! KRLB coming in hot, drawn with a split decision that he doesn't deserve. That'd be fun. <laughs> I mean, man, there is a there's a reason that I put Gutierrez in my parlay and not Phil Haas. I'll just yes. say that I'm yes. not. I'm not betting Duran win, but everybody counted him out against the Hoyo, and then he pulled off the upset. So I will be very, very tempted at going back to the well with that over one and a half because Duran win has a chin, and if he's going to win this fight, he's going to grapple. He's going to mm-hmm. close the distance. He's going to pin his buddy up against the cage. He's going to take him down. That's how he wins. So I might go back to that well of the over one and a half because I also think that Phil at this point has showed that he's not round one or bust. I think he can get the finish late and he can win a decision by having a more improved game plan. I, I think over one and a half is kind of a sneaky spot in this in this fight. Yeah, I agree. I think that that's probably the best bet. Uh, that I the most the thing that I like the best about this matchup, if I had to bet one, that over one and a half sounds better. All right. All right, I like it. Everybody just be warned. Be wary of parlaying Phil Haas (laughs) on Saturday. Next fight up, man. Maria Agapova is back in the UFC taking on Sabina Mazo. It's ladies' night, apparently, for the next couple of weeks. We got some hot young female prospects here that we get to talk about. Now, for those of you, again, I'm just got I gotta remind everybody, I got this set the stage here. Maria Agapova is the owner of the biggest upset in UFC history when she came in as a minus 1,200 favorite and got her ass kicked by mm-hmm. Janet Dobson uh, after putting everything into round one, not getting the finish, gassing hard, and then getting messed up in round two. I actually really like Maria Agapova, man. She is, she is a fighter that is intensity and aggression cranked to 11. Like, she just gives zero fucks and wants to go in there and murder anybody standing in front of her. She was doing some training at AGT sunrise posting pictures up on Instagram with my girl Jillian. And she got some time in at MMA masters posting pictures up with Colby Covington. She keeps an insane pace. She's tall. She's long. She knows how to use that reach and she swings from the hip. She has big knees that she likes to fire to the body of her opponents. She's got a strong body lock. She can grapple. She rips people to the floor with that thing. And she's got a decent ground and pound and submission game. She's more than willing to bite down on the mouthpiece and just go to war. Just trade bombs with people. The thing people seem to forget about Maria Agapova is how young she is. She is 24 years old and she's already a monster. She is just going to get better and better as she finds a gym and finds a home and gets improved on some of her skill set. Now, Sabina Mazzo, tall and long, she likes to pump that jab out in front of her opponent. She's got a really, really long reach, and she's got a long right hand. She likes that cross. She keeps a constant pace up. She's very high volume, but she's pillow fisty, man. She doesn't hurt anybody with her strikes. She does like to pepper people and make it difficult for you to close the distance. If you come in, you better be willing to eat about three shots to get there. But she's a turtle off for back. She doesn't seem to have the grappling chops she needs. In her last fight, she got beaten and had no way to get back to her feet, had no submission offense, really struggled when a a stronger wrestler got on top of her. Uh, She has a 66% takedown defense rating, which is a little bit concerning. So she's big. She's going to have a two-inch reach advantage here. But she's a tad on the slow side. What do you think on this one, Mike? Do we have a live underdog on our hands? Do you like the favorite here? What are you doing? Yeah, I, I I think Agapova uh, is the side to to pick here. I, I just Simina Mazo, she's uh, it's kind of... What's up, Danny? Oh no, you'll all have to forgive us with the uh, technology <laughs> issues we're having tonight. Uh, Seems sorry. like the internet's cutting in and out. Sorry, dude. It, it's been I fa- you know, Facebook's having issues, everyone's having issues, so it must dude. be going over. That's For crazy, anybody right? watching this, anybody in the future who's not watching this live on Monday night, today is the day that you know WhatsApp and Instagram and Facebook went down. Technology is on the fritz. Skynet is happening today. So forgive <laughs> us for the little bumps with the technology here. <laughs> Go yeah. ahead, man. Yeah, sorry about this. So yeah, with uh, Super Anna Maz, I'll start back. Like I said, she, she just reminds me a lot like a girl Gumby, man. She's super long and lanky, slow, doesn't throw a lot of volume. She definitely wants to get the, the fight down on the ground. Um, even though like she, she uh, trains with Kings MMA, you think she'd be a better striker, 
But Akapoov is, is going to be way superior, in my opinion, versus her standing up. Um, I think the Agapogova, you know, she, you know, it sucked that she had to take that negative 1400 loss versus Dobson or whatever it was, but it, you know, it happens, man. These, they're young and, you know, you blow your wad and that could happen to anyone coming out of a nightclub. So, you know, it is what it is. So Agapova here though, versus Mazo, I feel like this is the spot for her to finally kind of showcase her skills. I don't know if she's going to get a finish though. I, I feel like she, um, so it'd be the underdog of that. So like, so I, I didn't know Agapova was the underdog. That's crazy. Um, so yeah, I like Agapova here and I'd probably hit it by decision though. That would probably be, I'd look at the prop for that on the number because uh, most likely by decision. And then you probably get a better, even better number on the dog. Okay. Okay. So yeah, man, I pulled the trigger. I got plus 135 on Maria Agapova and it looks like money's coming in on Sabina Mazo. So if this line gets wider, don't be shocked. If I add a second unit to Maria Agapova, this is the perfect buy low spot for this fighter she opened up i mean her last fight she was a 12 to 1 favorite like the ufc the betting market everybody is expecting massive things from maria agapova and now we're getting her as an underdog because she went a little crazy in the yeah. off season because she gassed out because she was super excited to you know finish an opponent she's young folks she's young and she made a mistake that's a hole that she will patch and one thing one thing, yeah, no, uh, DXJ, I'm doing it. I'm doing it. I'm going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> the one thing, Mike, I got to tell you, this is an unofficial thing that I'm going to start tracking. The last female fighter that went to go rock and train with my girl Jillian Robertson, she just came back and she won her fight by first round submission. No one saw Hannah Goldie coming out and submitting her opponent in the very first round. That's what working with my girl Jillian in the mm -hmm. offseason will do for you. If you're telling me that Maria Agapova is strong, she is mean, she's going to have a speed advantage, and her submission skills are going to be sharp against an opponent with bad takedown defense, I'm loading up. I've already got one unit on it. I'm probably going to add another, and I'll be looking at that submission prop, man. I know you said the decision's probably the way to go, but like I said, I may actually push the boundaries mm -hmm. of this angle and see if I can't get a nice fat number on the submission for Maria Agapova because if it hits the floor, I think she's going to be looking for it. Yeah, and you know, another thing is Mazo, how do, she's never fought at 125 pounds, I believe, so she's dropping down from 135. I believe it's her first time. So uh, that's going to be interesting to see if she, if she, how she deals with that weight cut. That's true. She's a big, big woman. I mean, she's skinny, but she's huge. So that's going to be a tough weight cut on her if it is indeed her first time cutting down. That'll be interesting to keep our eyes on. I mean, man, I, I went down with the ship hard on Misha mm -hmm. on Saturday because I expected him to have a power advantage drop oh. in a weight class and. The that steroids weren't seem... the steroids weren't there, bro. No, it's not. <laughs> it's 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 not Mazo's uh, first fight at 125. She fought Alexis Davis at 135 last time and threw me off. Sorry. Okay. Okay. There we go. I was gonna say I that was gonna be news to me if that had been the case. Yeah. But I am uh, still still. I I think that I've said it before, man. I've talked about it with other fighters and other angles before. Speed kills in this game, and I just think the hand speed difference of Agapova is gonna be a problem. And if you're looking to gas this girl out, if you're looking to make her tired and get her out of there after she slows down, Mazo's not going to do that. Mazo keeps a pace, a very fine pace to strike at distance, stay on the outside, pepper her with a couple of light shots. Like she is not going to scare anybody with the pace that she's trying to put on. And she moves backwards a lot. Like I think Maria Agapova's hand speed advantage is going to be the difference maker, especially when mm -hmm. they're on the feet. And if she can make that body lock takedown work, we're golden. Yeah, I, I, you know, I think it could be right, man. I, Agapova is going to light her up in her face at some point. There's going to be some blood, I think. I, I agree. And Danny Betts trying to warn me that Agapova isn't a redhead. <laughs> Danny, she's an honorary redhead. She's crazy. <laughs> you know, she she fits right in. She can dye her hair after this fight. We adopted her. <laughs> uh, I have a weakness. All right. Mm. Next fight up. We are getting to we're getting to the meat and potatoes, folks. This card is uh, actually passing us by pretty quick here. We have got Tim Elliott taking on Mateus Nicolo. Nicolau? I said that wrong. Mm -hmm. Tim Elliott is a guy that I have very successfully faded the market on in his last couple of fights. 
Uh, I've been one of the few backers of Tim Elliott talking about how he can spring the upset. He's got a skill set that people are way down on. And I've made some good money on Tim Elliott in his recent run. But the fact is, Mike, I think that Tim Elliott at this stage of his career is limited. He is limited to being able to out grapple people and wet blanket them. He doesn't seem to submit anybody anymore. He doesn't have the power to knock anybody out anymore. He does have that awkward herky-jerky striking where it's kind of hard to get a hold of him, get your hands on him, or hit him. But at the end of the day, he goes, you know, almost one for one with his opponents on strikes. He relies on that durability. He relies on that chin. And he relies on being the bigger, stronger fighter of the two. I just think he's finally met his match. Mateusz Nicolo is a fighter that has paid his dues outside the UFC, racked up a ton of experience, and now he's finally getting back to where he always should have been. He's the younger fighter, and he's going to have a decent size advantage here in this spot. He is calm. He is calculated. He likes to work those leg kicks. He's got very tight boxing. He hits hard, and he's a strong wrestler. And I think that that really plays into this. Is Tim Elliott fought a couple of really low-end fighters his last couple fights, guys that slow down, guys that gas out. And because of that, he was able to take advantage of it. He's not fighting that here on Saturday. He's fighting a guy in Niccolo who is not going to make a wrong move. He's not going to take a bad step. And when they tie up, I think that Niccolo is going to be the stronger of the two men and negate that advantage that Tim Elliott has over a lot of his other opponents. The high IQ of Mateus Niccolo is something that I really, really want to get behind. And he only struggles with like fast twitch knockout power type of fighters. Those are the guys that really get in on Mateus Nicolo and cause him problems. And that is anything but what Tim Elliott is. I already lined up on this one, man. I got 1.65 units to win. One laid the chalk on Mateus Nicolo. How do you feel about this one? Yeah, we lost it at the perfect time again. The internet know. knows exactly when we don't want to pause. It's Go all ahead, good. Mike. How yeah, do you yeah. feel about I, this one? I actually I like this bet, man. Mateus Nikolai is a BJJ black belt, uh, super super slick on on the ground, but he also has really good striking. I mean, he stood with Manel Cape and didn't look bad at all. That's when I really was impressed with Mateus. Um, he's fighting, you know, Tim Elliott. With Tim Elliott, he, he, everyone talks about his transitions and his submissions and, and this BJ, you know, basically on kind of like a BJJ game. But, dude, how long has he been fighting? The dude's still a BJJ blue belt, and I'm not hating on anyone that's a BJJ blue belt. I'm ha- I'm just not liking how he's not progressing after his whole career. He's been a blue belt since he got here. I mean, when, <laughs> when does a purple belt come for you, bro, or do you not go to class? Because that's usually why you don't get, you know, striped up and then belted up. So I, 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 you know, like you said, he's, he's very fun. Tim Elliott. It'll come back. It'll come around. Just yeah. a sec. There it Sorry, goes. Guys. So w- <laughs> with, with this one, the BJJ skills of Nicolau and his hands, I think this is a, this is a great fight for Nicolau to win. I think he's going to win it easy. And I'm, I'm stoked. You got the 1.6 number. It's at negative 200 on Bovada now. Oh shit. So, you know, that's good for you, you know? Yeah, yeah, all right. Beat the line move there. Some money coming in on Nicolau. Yeah, I'm seeing uh, the best you can get at this stage is it looks like there's a minus 177 hanging out there at Unibet, but it's all the way up to minus 190, minus 200 in most places. So glad to see that I beat the market move there in that spot. The line's getting juicier for those of you who are looking to back Tim Elliott in this spot. Man, the fact for me is that I feel like Tim Elliott is a middle-of-the-road guy. His losses are all to the elite fighters of the division. His wins are to all the guys that are probably going to get cut in the UFC. He's somewhere in the middle. I do think that Nicolau is a guy that can crack into that contender status. I think he's got a lot of upside, and I think this is just a spot where a lot of people are going to jump on board with Tim Elliott because of his recent run, and that's where I've been on that recent run, and I'm ready to get off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just checked on my bookie. I, I, I use Bovada. I just always trusted them, and it's negative 200 already. There you go. There you go. All right. Well, I'm glad we agree on that one, man, and I'm glad that uh, it's always nice to beat a market move. You know, Clo- Closing line value is one of those things that a lot of people poo-poo it. A lot of people don't care. 
about the closing line value, but I'm a firm believer that if you get out ahead and you get the best of the number in the long run, that will make the difference. And a I small agree. sample size, one weekend, two fights, not going to matter, obviously. Mm. But when you do it over the course of hundreds of bets, it's something that I try to focus on. And I think it's part of the reason why I'm still keeping my head above water with my record when uh, you know things don't go right. I get better numbers on those dogs sometimes that kind of help bring it back around. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, you do incredible, bro. Especially your sprinkles. Th th those are the ones I love watching you hit. Oh, dude, the sprinkle. It's my favorite. And I'll be honest. I was really upset on Saturday that Carol Rosa didn't get that third round TKO. Uh, I had a half unit on Rosa by knockout. And mm. then I had the, the quarter unit sprinkle on round three. If we had been able to get both of those, I mean, it just would have been glorious to, to yeah. double up on that spot. Yeah, I showed you that parlay. I, I did nine fights and I missed one of them, right? On uh, oh, yeah. yeah, and I and I remember we, I was arguing with someone online when I they, I said, "Why are they going to give that guy, you know, the fifteen uh, leg was it fifteen <laughs> leg NFL bet?" I said, "How are you going to give yeah. that guy money? He lost. When I lose, I lost. I got eight of nine. I didn't get no promotional trophy. Bovada didn't send me any money. <laughs> My bank account, I, there was nothing there. It was weird. It was weird how I lost, but I was supposed to be happy for someone else just getting gifted a hundred G's for losing." I feel you there, man. I feel you. And that was me. We were definitely talking about that. Yeah, I, uh, I know. I just like seeing people win money. I, oh, I do too. I want to see know, you man. win 100 Gs. Not, I, that, just, guy, that guy That guy never bet in his life. They gave that to him for fun or when he what checked in. Yep. I'm, I'm right there with you. I want to see somebody in the modern day MMA community just sm smash one man like one yeah. of the one of the personalities that we all ride with and talk to every single week on twitter and shit like that yeah. when one of us hits a big one like i can't wait i can't wait it doesn't even need to be me like i will be so happy <laughs> if one of the boys or even one of the girls i know there's a couple of you know female mma cappers that are kind of on the rise right now like nice. i hope one of us crushes one of these events and just breaks a book that'd be amazing yeah, like on DraftKings, I love when I see people from our community just dominating and making money off of five bucks. Yeah, feels good. Definitely feels good. I'll get there one of these days, man. Uh, I, it's funny. I just picked up DraftKings. They just went live in Arizona, so I haven't been able to play it all that uh, much. Um, but I'm getting better. And it's funny because uh, so far I've done better in uh, football than I have with MMA on the DraftKings stuff. That's funny. And when I say doing better, I've been like <laughs> doubling up whatever I do on DraftKings. I haven't been able to hit anything big at all, but I always seem to find the bed shitter in MMA. <laughs> like I'll, I'll be like, I'm so confident on this one guy and they'll score like, 75 or 80 points. And that's just yeah. never going to get you where you need to be. <laughs> Definitely. It hurts when and, it happens. You know, Dave Crack, you are absolutely a thousand percent correct. Shout out to the man himself, the legend, Cody Saftik, the dog nice. or past podcast was the very first MMA betting show that I ever listened to before the diehard MMA podcast was just a twinkle in my eye, had no intentions ever of doing my own show. I was listening to Cody and Paul and Cody just broke the bookies, cashed a $41,000 in the last month by dude. sweeping three cards in a row. Like such a G dude. It's so, that's so awesome. Yeah. He Shout is out a to him. monster. Uh, Burgundy bets degenerate action tonight is Raiders plus three. I sprinkled that money line and I've got Waller anytime TD and over five and a half receptions. That's where I'm at tonight. All right. We are at a banger co-main event, man. Randy Brown taking on Jared Gooden, the night train choo choo motherfucker. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and Never. as some of you may know, Shout out to Half the Battle. We're just giving all the love tonight. Like, mm -hmm. I'm just, everybody, like, comment your favorite show. I'm just going to shout everybody out. Now, Half the Battle, um, my boy Dan, they are close with Jared Gooden. So he's got the inside scoop there. He was cutting weight with him for his last fight. I've got a, you know, a six degrees of separation love for Jared Gooden here on this spot. I really, really like both of these guys, man. Randy Brown. He's been spending time training with uh, Vittorian Gastelum, apparently. He's super long. He's a dangerous finisher. He knows how to start fast these days. He attacks that low calf, doubles up on the jab. He's got cracking power. And when they hit the ground, he's got nasty submissions, man. He hunts the back super quickly, transitions very, very smoothly, very, very well. And he's got a filthy top game. Like when he gets on top of you, he is very dangerous. 
uses those long limbs to tie up people's legs and hunt sneaky submissions. He'll have a one inch reach advantage in this spot, which is saying something because Jared Gooden is another guy that's built very well for this division. Got a long reach, got a good solid stocky build, and he's coming off a career saving knockout win over Stoltz, a short notice fill in. He went out there in the first round and knocked the guy dead. Thank Hmm. God I cashed in on that one. I almost didn't bet it. Was super excited when Jared Gooden got the win there. He's well-rounded. He's durable. I believe he's a brown belt in Brazilian jiu-jitsu. He's got good, sharp boxing, explosive power, decent head movement. And honestly, man, he's got a chin on him. He's one of those guys that gets rocked but just never gets knocked out. Like, we've seen him wobble, but he recovers, and he fights his way back into this thing. If there was ever a live dog on the card, I feel like it's this one. I think I might be on Jared Gooden by fight time, man. We got minus 240 on Randy Brown, plus 200 on Jared Gooden. And it's not so much that I doubt the skills of Randy Brown because I know how good that kid is, but I just think that Jared Gooden is a very underrated commodity in the UFC so far. How do you feel about this fight? Oh, this is going to be an absolute treat to watch. You know, I think I think because of the, uh, it's MMA Twitter, we just have a lot of love for Jared Good and the Night Train. Like you said, half the battle sponsored him, and so uh, I I I don't know if it's personal. I don't know if that's leaking into is that he does. He's really skilled, really talented too, like you said. And but I I think a little bit of my personal love is leaking into Jared Gooden. Um, you know, he's he's lost uh, two of the three fights in the UFC. One of them was versus Alan Alan Joban. Um, I feel like if he lost the fight to Alan Joban, uh, in the sense that Randy Brown is like a gazelle, he's so athletic and so explosive and he's been training now with these savages with his wrestling. Um, and, and like, I, he's, he was so young when he got to us that he just keeps excelling and excelling. I do feel like the line is, is a little pricey for this one. Um, but because Jared Gooden could end your night at any moment. If, if you give him the chance, like he he showed Stolta. But Randy Brown, man, um, he's just improved and keeps improving. And I, I, I'm just starting to like him. You know, he's only lost to Vincente Luque. Luque's been killer as of, you know, the, his last uh, few bouts and stuff. So going to be talking yeah. about Luque at a title soon. Yeah. So, you know, I, man, but does Jared Gooden have the same power Luque does to knock him out? Yeah. So th- it, it's crazy. I'm not putting this in a parlay and I'm not, it's not I'm on my money line bet, but I'm going to back Randy Rude Boy Brown. I think this guy's incredible and in finally uh, showcasing his skills as an athlete. If this it just if this Jared Gooden versus him, if it was someone else other than Randy Brown, I'd, I'd jump on Jared Gooden uh, for sure. But dude, Randy Brown is is no joke, man. This guy's just so explosive, and I feel like he's a little more explosive than Jared Gooden. Okay, that's fair. So slight disagreement here, but I mean, man, it's for me, it's all about that number. You know what I mean? Like, I just feel like Jared Gooden's being a little disrespected at this point. This is not me saying that I don't like Randy Brown or I don't see how good Randy Brown is because trust me, I do. And like Mm -hmm. you mentioned, man, he was young. Now he has paid his dues and he is right where he is supposed to be. This kid is going to be a beast. He's going to be a monster. I just don't know that Jared Gooden should be a plus 200 dog to anybody. Like if he can take a shot or two and then fire back, this guy's got power too. And we've seen Randy Brown hurt. So it's not like it's a lock. You know what I'm saying? Oh yeah. No, not at all. This is going to be a scary fight for someone that's, if they're slamming a uh, rude boy Brown, you're, you're going to be, it's going to be hairy. Cause he's a, he's only a purple belt in BJJ. Gooden's a Brown belt. Like you said, I think that one of the, not only could Gooden knock him out, but he could get him down the ground, sub him, man. A uh, rude boy Brown. He, he's, you know, shown that he's, he's not fully, there yet when it comes to that ground game that's why he's training so hard there i i agree with you man i agree with you now let's talk about the total on this one though total is uh it looks like no total yet sorry fight goes to decision is plus 140 fight doesn't go the distance minus 180 that's another decent price for violence in my opinion man Uh, both these guys can finish anybody the toughness of Jared Gooden not to go unconscious is the one thing that would kind of have me concerned with that, but I'd be kind of eyeballing a violence bet here. Yeah, I, I think that that'd be a, a good call, and I'd like I said to get a better number and have both fighters. I like having both fighters when it comes to this, when the people are going to bang, and I feel like, like I said, Randy, uh, Randy Brown could end this quick, and so could Jared, so it could go either way, like you said, so that'd be a good, a good bet. I kind of feel like this is going to be a one-round fight, if I'm being honest. I, I I feel like there's going to be just violence immediately, and what some there's just too much power between these two guys. Yeah. And once these there's like two freight trains hitting each other, and that's why the night train is hoping to shine bright. 
All right, man. Hey, I'm glad we may disagree on the side, but I'm glad we agree on the violence. Maybe we found a nice little angle there for ourselves. So, all right, man, it's time to talk about the main event of the evening. But of course, before that, got to hear a quick word from our sponsors. everybody welcome back to the Die Hard MMA podcast we are talking UFC Vegas 39 I'm talking with my man real Mike here and we're breaking down these fights for your betting entertainment and I got to tell you I love those little breakaway cuts my hour my, my mm-hmm. ass has been sitting in this chair for an hour and 20 minutes now and it gives me two seconds to scratch the itch on my damn nose that I've been trying to ignore on camera <laughs> the whole time it's the most <laughs> Uh, I love it. Give me 15 seconds off camera. <laughs> oh, I feel you, bro. When I was doing my show al- alone, you know, so when you don't have a guest, that's when you're really like, oh man, I can't, I can't do anything <laughs> over here. I can't even take a, I can't stand up and stretch my back for a second. So I yep, get it. Yep. Yep. You get that tickle in the back of your throat. You got the scratch and you're like, ah, don't do it. Don't talk. Okay. All right, <laughs> man. All right. What we've got to talk about now is a fight that a lot of people have been kind of poo-pooing for the main event here. And I don't get it. This is spectacular. Marina Rodriguez taking on Mackenzie Dern. Like, out of women's MMA, what more do you want besides Amanda Nunez or Rose Namahunez or Valentina? Like, these are the clear contenders in this division. And they're not boring whatsoever. The way these two women come to fight, like... I'll pay money for this fight. This is a phenomenal fight. Marina Rodriguez, as most of you know who have tuned into this show before, is my girl. She's been my dark horse for a long time. I love the power that she brings to the table. She's got freakish knockout power for the women's division. She's tall. She's long. She's aggressive. She's mean. She knows how to go for the kill. Love everything about Marina Rodriguez except her damn takedown defense. Every once in a while, her fight IQ is a bit of a problem because she accepts the bottom position. She kind of reminds me of Kevin Holland. She'll get taken down, and then she just stays safe. She's like, I'm just not going to do anything until they stand me back up for round two. Her takedown defense is a stiff jab. Like, that's how Mm -hmm. she stops people from coming in for a takedown is by punching them in the face. (laughs) Now, Mackenzie Dern on the flip side of this, she is on the Clint do not fade list. Mm-hmm. I have tried and I have failed to bet against Mackenzie Dern. I was sure that the holes in her offensive wrestling and the holes in her striking were going to catch up to her. I thought she was going to end up running into somebody who she couldn't quite get to the ground. And every single time she has proven me wrong, man. She has, she's gotten the perfect set of fighters who will just fall into her garden, let her submit them. And now she's finally had the amount of time she needs to, to put a good, well-rounded MMA game together. And she's a beast. So I missed my opportunity. It's too late. Her offensive wrestling isn't quite where it needs to be, but she handled Nina. And that was a big freaking deal. I thought Nina was going to be the one to spoil the show. And she got run through. Now, granted, she was coming back off of a pregnancy break, which we always know that can be sketchy for women fighters, so we can take a little bit of a grain of salt with that win. The fact of the matter is she's world-class, man. Her BJJ is something else. If she can get you on the ground, you are in trouble. And the problem with this fight for me is that it's striker versus grappler. It's very clearly defined for each other's skill sets. Talk to me, Mike. What do you see happening in this fight on Saturday? 
Yeah, like you said, I mean, it is striker versus grappler and to see who's closed uh, each side of their game that they had loopholes in. Uh, Mar Marina Rodriguez, so much fun to watch striking when she could keep it up with uh, in the clinch, with elbows, what, whatever she wants to uh, put off on her opponent. But it, once she gets dropped onto the ground, man, she just lays there, man. And that's what kills me when I watch them, people not shrimping, not pushing off with their feet, not trying to get to the cage, not – I, it's not explode, not move, not do anything, but just kind of lay there. And I, it makes me sick when I see the uh, the pro athletes doing that. And so that's Marina Rodriguez's uh, detriment to her is that she accepts bottom position quite easily. With this said, she's only a, uh, she's a purple belt in BJJ, Marina Rodriguez. She's going up against the decorated black belt of Mackenzie Dern here, man. Um, I don't like that uh, for Marina Rodriguez. I love Marina Rodriguez like you did. I've been high on her since the beginning. But man, one takedown here and Mackenzie Dern could could end this the, the night. So it's as far uh, Mackenzie Dern so much better on the ground than Marina Rodriguez. I it's like I it, is Marina that far ahead of Mackenzie Dern standing? She sharpened up so much with um, Perlo, and now you're, it, it's it's very hard to say who's closing the gaps faster. But I'm I've I've doubted Mackenzie Dern so many times. That I I don't know if it's now my bias and love for Marina, Marina Rodriguez in this spot specifically because I like the violence she brings, but she d accepts bottom position too much and I cannot back that. So um, with that said, I would have to go with the BJJ black belt Mackenzie Dern. Okay, okay, man, I uh, I get it, I get it. I have two rules and one of them is you don't fade Mackenzie Dern. We went over that one. <laughs> The other rule is you bet Marina Rodriguez at plus money because uh -oh. we're not getting that, man. Like, when she is on top of the world, which she will be very shortly, you're just never going to get plus money on this chick anymore. So I have two conflicting angles in my brain right now where I want to take the dog money on Marina Rodriguez because it is hard to come by. But I've lost so much money to Mackenzie Dern already that I don't want to line up in front of her again. We got to talk about the apex again, man. We got to talk about the small cage yeah. that absolutely favors the grapplers. That's going to be a bit of a problem because if we were in the big cage, I'm like 90% confident that Marina Rodriguez could footwork, jab and cross her way away from Mackenzie Dern and stay safe. But in the small cage, she may run into that fence. She may run out of space to use that footwork and that's going to be a serious problem if she does yeah, the problem for me the problem for me is black belts turn into white belts when you punch them in the face man yep mckenzie dern everyone's talking about how her striking has come along everyone's talking about how great she looks on the feet she puts her head down like this and then walks forward and swings punches marina rodriguez is going to have a field day with that, all it's going to take is one or two big shots to change the trajectory of this fight in a big, big way. You look back at Mackenzie Dern's fight with Verna Janjaroba, a fight that was very close. And if I'm being honest, I scored that one for Verna. Verna busted her up, and Verna does not hit as hard as Marina Rodriguez does. So if we have another situation where a grappler has fallen in love ever so slightly with their striking and Dern doesn't immediately sell out for the takedown, we could see another dead body in the UFC cage mm -hmm. when Marina Rodriguez lands a bomb. This is a spot where I know the world is on Dern and I know everyone is going to scream, don't do it, but I'm going to wait and see how wide this line gets, Mike. Yeah. If I can get Marina Rodriguez at plus 150 or better, that's a must bet for me. She's already all the way up to plus 145 Yep, mm -hmm. in some spots. It's headed that way. I'm going to be greedy, and I'm going to sit back. If Marina Rodriguez gets to be a bigger dog, I I'm going to have to take the shot again simply because I feel like the path to victory for Dern is only, only the grappling. And if she can't get a takedown, it's over for her. Yeah, I, I I agree, man. I just uh, it's just tough to, to kind. Of, I just love grappling and wrestling, so I'm just I just I see her on her back in my brain, and I can't get it out. I get that. <laughs> I get that, and that's uh, that's the problem because it's it's so binary. You know, she's just yeah. gonna it, Dern will slice through the guard of Marina Rodriguez if it hits the floor. I know that. <laughs> now, shout out to my guy Reggae Panda for bringing up my next point for me. The under two and a half is a pick'em. Dude, 
This is violence. This is absolutely a violence bet because Marina Rodriguez, I don't know how long she can survive under Mackenzie Dern. And if Dern can't get the takedown, I don't think Dern can make it 10 minutes. I think this is a beautiful underspot. Even though we talk all the time about how women's MMA, you know, you gotta you gotta bet the, the low buy the buy low spots on the overs because they go to the judges so often. These are the two exceptions to that rule. These are the two women who finish people super quickly that I kind of love an under two and a half in this spot. What do you what do you think, Mike? Yeah, I, I agree because uh, Dern, Dern, as a grappler, you want to get it where there's no sweat on the other your opponent. So she wants she I think she'd want to get this girl down immediately. So round one, round two, so that works out perfect. And then with the same thing, the striking of Marina is vicious, man. If she lands an elbow to Dern's face, cuts her up, um, and she's bleeding, you know that they could stop it. You get a referee stoppage from a cut. Um, normally, women's MMA, you know how that line is. The over is usually way higher than a pick 'em. We're talking about what negative 400s we get all the time. We get negative 300s consistently. And now we have a pick 'em at the two and a half mark. So the fishiness of that throws a red flag. And I, I like the under now because of it. Okay. All right. I feel that, man. I like it. So slightly on opposite sides here for the main event. It's all good. We had a couple of disagreements on the card, but I also feel like we found a couple of solid spots where we agree and sync up. And I think that's going to be some good uh, money, money making opportunities for all of us, man. So that's UFC Vegas 39, everybody. Mike, it was an absolute pleasure hanging out and chatting with you. We appreciate you coming on the show. Uh, I'd love for you to take a minute, let the people know where they can find you. Shout out what you got going on. Floor is yours, man. Uh, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here with your fans. Uh, I'm uh, t- Wednesday, every Wednesday night, 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on HAPS TV. It pushes out on uh, YouTube, on my Facebook, on uh, uh, Twitter. And then also wanted to uh, just thank my sponsors, Melon Brand Hats, M-E-L-I-N. It's a luxury line of hats my boy in high school uh, dreamed up. Really cool stuff. So make sure you go give them some love. And just uh, thank you so much for giving me your platform, Quint. Hey, my pleasure, man. It's uh, long overdue. Glad we got to finally sit down and talk some fights. Appreciate you coming on the show for sure, man. Um, like we talked about backstage <laughs> before the show, I'm going to break down some contender series. So your call if you want to hang out on stream or if you're ready to bounce and watch some football. <laughs> I guess we're going to skip. I'm going to go feed the family, brother. I always appreciate your time and uh, watch some football. So uh, nice being with you, dude. It was a pleasure, man. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Enjoy uh, your Monday yeah. night football and uh, God bless care. with the family. You too. Later, man. All right. All right. What's going on, everybody? We have lost some viewers because Monday Night Football is back on track. It's gotten started. 157 live viewers still hanging out with me. Appreciate each and every one of you. Let's talk about the Contender Series because we have Dana White's Tuesday Night Contender Series coming up, and I am ready to go. Let me get this up here on Tapology so I can get the uh, I can get the right fights up for you for us to talk about. All right, hanging out, talking fights, making some money. Let's go. First fight up on the Contender Series is Patrick White taking on Gennaro Valdez, and in this spot, folks, I've said it before, I will say it again. You can take the fighter out of Alaska, but you can never take the Alaska FC out of a fighter. And that's right. Patrick White comes to us from the fabled Alaska FC, one of the worst promotions on the planet that gives us just the worst prospects in the UFC who have the most padded records and none of the skills to bring home the paycheck. He, it's really hard to find tape. On Patrick White, I'll be honest, but he is tall, he is long, he has some boxing matches from Alaska Combat Sport that you can watch, and I'll admit he's got decent power, he's got good hands, he is athletic, I will give him that, but that's about it, that's where the skill ends for Patrick White, he's been able to knock some absolute bums out that aren't able to box with him, and unsurprisingly so, Valdez on the flip side of this thing, dude is mean, he is explosive, he is fast, He has beautiful timing on his double legs, very aggressive, 
attacks in combination always, and he always punches his way in for level changes. He's got a big right hand, and his top game is just something beautiful. Solid positional control. He is position over submission and just relies on those dominant positions and transitions slowly back to further dominant positions. Nasty ground and pound with his elbows. I love Valdez in this spot. He's the biggest favorite on the Dana White Contenders card this week, and I do have a parlay for Contender Series only with Valdez in it. I will fade the Alaska FC every opportunity that I get, and I simply think that this is going to be a spot where he puts White out of his element, puts him on his ass, and then elbows him into the floor. That's what I'm doing. Next fight up, I'm going to fire rapidly a little bit through these uh, Dana White Contender Series fights here because I'm hungry. (laughs) <laughs> the second fight that we've got coming up here, Shante Barnes taking on Joseph Holmes. And this one has me scratching my head a little bit. This one is not as clear cut as other people are, are making it out to be. In fact, I'm, I'm a little bit nervous about this one. So to get started here, let me pull my, my lines up here. Shante Barnes is a plus 300 underdog to Joseph Holmes. And I kind of get it. Holmes is, they call him the ugly man. (laughs) What a horrible fight name. Like, what kind of friends do you have in your gym that are going to be like, bro, when they introduce you, they should be like, the ugly man. Like, what the (laughs) fuck? All right. You got to get some better gym mates, man. That's, That's like slow Mike Rodriguez. It's worse. Anyway, Holmes has competed on uh, Bellator and LFA. He's got some solid outside the UFC promotional experience, which I think is part of why he's getting this line that he's getting right now. He's a short notice fill in. Cody Brundage was supposed to be in this spot, but he got called up to the UFC for that fight card. So they had to find a short notice replacement. Now Holmes is long, but he's got really bad takedown defense. He's got a good get up game, but you can absolutely put this guy on his ass. Now he himself has a good body lock takedown. He loses top position in scrambles, though. He's really sloppy when you get him down on the mat. He's got a nice jab. He's got a long one, too. He's got explosive power clinch knees. He's a finisher. I absolutely love what this guy does on the feet, but his ground game is very concerning. Shout out to you, buddy. Thank you so much again for coming on the show. Um, Shante Barnes, on the flip side of this thing, has a solid physical frame. He, on the other hand, scrambles very well on the ground. He has explosive power, nasty pull counters. When he gets you coming forward and then plants and comes back at you, this man can knock people out. He strikes extremely well moving backwards. He's got fast, accurate hands. And honestly, he's got a tight squeeze on him too. I've seen him really put some people in trouble on the mat. He is mean. And when he gets on top of people, he rains down punishment. Shante Barnes Kind of reminds me of Chaos Williams. He's that type of fighter that's got big power and likes to hurt people. Like, that's that's kind of the vibe that I get from this dude. I do want to shout out the fact, though, that he beat this guy named Jay Ellis on the regional scene, who is literally 15 and 100. 100 losses, this guy, Jay Ellis. And he continues to fight MMA. He's He's got four fights that went to decision. Out of his 100 losses... 96 of them were by finish. I know we're not talking about him, but what? Jay, do something else with your life, buddy. Get another hobby. (laughs) I don't know what he's doing. So, so, I am extremely tempted, extremely tempted on Shante Barnes in this spot. As a three to one underdog, a guy that just brings violence, a fight where the under a fight where the fight doesn't go the distance is all the way chalked up to minus 380. They're expecting a finish. I think Shante Barnes is better on the ground than Holmes is. I think he can win in some of those scrambles. I think he's live for a submission. And on the feet, he's the type of guy that will get that flash knockout, that big upset win that nobody sees coming. I think Shante Barnes is worth a sprinkle. I might take a little stab on Shante Tuesday. Haven't got there yet because right now everybody's parlaying up the other guy and that line just keeps on climbing up. So we'll see how high it gets. I might just do a half unit because he's kind of expected to be walked on, but I think he's more live than people are giving him credit for. 
Next up, Joshua Weems taking on Fernie Garcia. Weems' last fight was on the Game Bread FC Bare Knuckle MMA Fight Show, which was pretty entertaining. He actually tried the uh, Game Bread Flying Knee, which was cool. I mean, come on. If you're on the first ever Game Bread Fight Card, you got to try the Game Bread Flying Knee. That's a good move. That was a good move. Didn't work, though. Good offensive wrestling this kid has. Strong underhook game. Likes to pressure people up against the cage. Knows how to dig for those hooks. He's good in ground scrambles. Very, very good. He establishes top position. He kind of dominates in the ground game, but he falls off. He is absolutely the opposite of what we just talked about. He is a submission over position guy looking for that finish constantly. He puts himself in very bad positions because he is more than confident that he can sweep that he can out-grapple, that he can out-wrestle his opponents and get back to a dominant position. So that's something that we need to remember about Josh Weems because when he, if he gets to the UFC, when he reaches that higher level, if he doesn't learn to quit doing that shit, he's going to end up having some problems. He's going to end up making mistakes against the wrong opponent and just never being able to get back up. But on the regional scene at the lower level, seems to be working for him. He's also a guy that's very dangerous late. He's got a good gas tank. He's got multiple second and third round finishes. So even if he does put himself in those problem areas, he ends up coming back and ends up winning very, very confidently. Questions around Josh Weems. He missed weight by like four pounds. He's coming in on short notice here in this spot and I think he's a little big for the division. I also have some concerns that this is one of those weight cuts where he probably just didn't want to keep cutting. So it may be more of an advantage than a disadvantage in this particular spot. We'll see. But I think Weems is going to have a a slight edge because of the extra weight here. Fernie Garcia on the flip side of this thing keeps his hands low, boxing heavy attack, likes to change levels and keep his opponents guessing, good at controlling the range, very good at spatial awareness. Tough, durable grinder are the notes that I put on Fernie Garcia. He's a good fighter at being all in, all out. You can't touch him or he's going to be in where he wants to be. He's another guy that's been chin checked before and keeps coming. So you know he can take some damage. You know he can take a beating. The only problem for me with him is his style is not pleasing to the eye. He does a lot of things that judges will not see as winning the fight. Very risk adverse in my opinion. And because of that, He has four fights that have gone to split decision. However, he's only lost one of those four fights. So we have another very sticky situation here where honestly, we might have another live dog because Weems is heavy. He's he's a plus 200 underdog, plus 210 in some places. He's four pounds overweight and he's taking on a guy who notoriously lets fights stay close. He goes to the scorecards all the time and he doesn't do the things that you need to do to get the win. So I kind of have a little bit of an inclination to back Weems here. Having missed weight, being the bigger man, that wrestling upside, even though he tends to make those mistakes, we've seen fighters step up in the contender series. We've seen fighters kind of turn that mini corner and be like, look, I'm in front of Dana White. I'm in front of the UFC. I can't lose this. And then they kind of show off some skills that we've never really been privy to before they get to the big show. So I could absolutely see Weems maybe not diving for that arm bar, maybe not rolling for the opportunity to get the finish and potentially staying a little bit safer and getting the win. Just my uh, outside shot here, my outside opinion or angle on this spot. That's kind of how I feel this particular fight is going to go. I think it's going to be a lot closer than people expect it to be. And I could absolutely see Weems either finishing or walking away with a close tight split decision. I'm very tempted by another underdog on this very, very, very sketchy Dana White contender series card. The next fight up is what would be considered the co-main event for our Dana White contender series card. Daniel Barnes taking on Carlos Hernandez. And this one is one of those ones that I feel like is almost too close to call. Daniel Barnes hasn't fought since 2019. Good footwork, stays right in front of his opponents, but very elusive. Good, good uh, avoidance. Solid hands, good power, got a great gas tank, and a strong top game. When he gets on top of you, he is hard to handle. He attacks with elbows. He always likes to go for chokes. He's got a tight squeeze on him, but he's got bad takedown defense. 
His getup game is okay, but it needs some work. He's a guy that got taken down in his last fight, uh, round one, and just never stood back up. He waits for the end of the round. No sense of urgency whatsoever. Carlos Hernandez, nice footwork, good in and out movement, good head movement. He's another guy that controls the range very well, and he strikes in combinations, always attacking two, three, four punches, never just one and done. He's got a sharp right cross, and his best path to victory is on the mat. He's got good, solid blast doubles, and he's a guy that likes to chase the back. He likes to transition very, very quickly to his opponent's weakness and then backpack them or go for submissions from that position. And what we've got here is Barnes is a minus 125 favorite. You can get even money or plus 105 on Hernandez. And man, I guess I'm just going dog hunting on the contender series because I I think that Hernandez is the side here with the questions that I have about Barnes, with the fact that he can get put on his back and just never move from that position ever again. I got to favor the guy that seems like he's a bit of a stronger wrestler. And if it helps us at all, my guy Gianni, the Greek gambler, shout out uh, the Greek gambler. He likes Carlos Hernandez as well. So very tempted to put a little something on Hernandez at slight plus money when I think he's going to be the one that can take advantage of the grappling here. Appreciate you for tuning in, Billy. Sorry, I'm not keeping up too much with the chat here at this point, guys. I'm trying to crank through the last little bit here of the show. Almost done. Only got one more fight to talk about, and then we'll get done with this. A9! (laughs) Yep, I am... uh, the combination of Anthony Smith and Ben Rothwell. That's uh, <laughs> Those are my dads. So next up, the final fight on Dana White's Tuesday Night Contender Series. We have Mike Malat taking on Shimon Strominsky. Strominsky, yeah, something like that. Don't know how to pronounce that last name. I apologize. Uh, Mike Malat is going to be my other parlay leg. I told you guys earlier in the evening that I was parlaying up Valdez. I'm going to be closing that out with Mike Malat. I like this kid a lot. Ha! Bad joke. <laughs> Shimon starts fast. He punches his way into the clinch. He's got a good body lock. He likes to grind his opponents up against the fence. He's got solid trip takedowns. And he keeps the range with his kicks, kind of using them like a jab, uses his feet like a jab. He's got a big left body kick. He attacks the legs of his opponent. He's one of these fighters that's good in round three. I've seen him be in trouble in some fights and then dig deep and just keep grinding away, even though he's tired and wear on his opponent late, which is uh, honestly something I'm a little bit scared of because you never know how these fights are going to go. And if it comes down to round three and someone wants it more, Shimon is the type of guy that's generally succeeded in that area. Now, Mike Malott, He's a bit of a slow starter as opposed to the fast start of his opponent. He has beautiful timing on his counter punches, though. He's one of these guys where timing and accuracy is more than speed, but it works. He's got a gorgeous lead check left hook, explosive takedowns, and when he gets you on the ground, he's always one step ahead. He's one of those guys where as soon as he hits the takedown, he's on your back. He knows the escape that you're going for. He knows the defense that you're going for. And he counters that before you realize what he's doing. If he, I've seen it so many times on the footage. He hits a blast double. And literally the next thing is he's backpacked the guy already because he just has such good spatial awareness on the mat. He's got a nasty rear naked choke. And he's more than willing to just grind out a backpack style position to get the win. And his only loss on his professional record is to none other than mean Hakim Duwadu. So if that says anything, he's smoking anybody but UFC caliber competition. I like the fact that he knows how to grind. I like the fact that he can out grapple his opponent. And I like the fact that he's positionally solid when it comes to the ground. I'm on Mike Malott. I got a minus 222 price tag parlaying Mike Malott with Valdez. I have laid 2.44 units. To win two on that one. Richard, I see you, buddy. That's the parlay right there. And then if I'm being honest, I think every single other dog on this Contender Series card is live. I think that Hernandez at Pick'em is the side. I think that Weems with that weight cut and the size advantage is probably the way to go. And then Barnes is maybe the upset of the night. I'm hoping I can get plus 400 on that kid by the time the fight kicks off because I just think that people are counting him out. And I think that he's got pads to victory. That's one of those ones where I may look stupid for backing the three and a half or four to one dog because he gets flatlined in the first round. 
but we expect that, right? Like you've only got to be right one out of every four times when you take a dog that size. So I'm very, very tempted to take the shot on the big dog because I think Holmes is a little overblown at this stage. That's the Tuesday Night Contender Series breakdown for you guys. We're about at the two-hour mark. Thank you all. You're the real ones that have stuck with me this long. I appreciate you guys. Do me a favor. Subscribe here on Pub Sports if you haven't already. Smash the like button. We bring awesome, awesome content to you all every single day of the week. And I do have to apologize to my guys, Connor Mack and Ian Cameron, because I shout out a lot of shows on this podcast, but I routinely forget to give them their shine. And... They deserve it. Make sure you te- check out my boys Ian Cameron and Connor Mack. They break down baseball every single day of the week. And one of my favorite things to do is to tail their jack of the day, which is the home run props that they hit. And they hit some big, juicy ones. My style of sports betting steering into that variance. Aiden, you are right. My boy Brandon Davis is back in the UFC. I knew one of these days he'd work his way back in. He was way too damn good to have ever been cut by the organization. We'll see what he comes in at because that guy is underratedly skilled and everyone has a bad opinion of him. We might be fading the market on that one. We'll see what kind of line we get. His opponent is a scary one. I'll admit that. For his first fight, he's got a terrifying opponent. So we'll see what happens. But he's a good dude, and I'm excited to see what he can do in his second run here in the UFC. That's the show, folks. Thank you all very much. I do want to just leave you with this thought. Every once in a while, I circle back to the quote at the beginning of the show. It's always something goofy. I try to do something funny. I want to make you guys laugh. It's a social reference or something like that. But every once in a while, you will get the Apollo Creed Rocky Three. There is no tomorrow quote from me. And I love that quote. It means so much to me. I grew up watching those Rocky movies and they taught me, and this may sound cheesy, but seriously, watching Rocky made me want to fight from a very young age, teach you never to give up. They teach you the kind of hard work and dedication, the championship heart, the comeback, the underdog story. I love the Rocky movies and Apollo Creed telling Rocky When he had a bad day, when he got down on himself, when he was feeling tired, when he didn't have the motivation, and he said, I'll do it tomorrow. And Apollo roared at him that there is no tomorrow. That just speaks to my soul, man. Like, if you've got something that you want done, if you've got a goal, if you've got an ambition in life, there is no tomorrow. you got to pick yourself up. If there's something you're working for, no one's going to hand it to you. You're the only one who can make that happen. And you treat every minute of the day like it's precious. Because if you take it off, that chance can slip away. There is no tomorrow, folks. We're going to work our asses off. We're going to close 2021 strong. And I'm going to bounce back from that disappointing seven-unit loss this week. We're going to murder some MMA sports betting this week. You go out, you kill it. Good luck on all of your degenerate action, no matter what that is. And whatever that goal that you've set for yourself is, whatever that thing that you're pushing off, that you're waiting to change, do it tomorrow. Go out and kick some ass this week, you guys. Let's roll.